we are finally going to finish up chapter six, section two, um, all about severe weather. Um, Earth has some really um, violent, severe weather patterns uh, that can happen if, if conditions are just right. So we are going to be talking about those today. So first of all, this is one that is very common for us. Uh, thunderstorms. Thunderstorms happen lots of places on Earth. They are happening, I believe, at any given time. If I remember the facts correctly, it's like there's a thousand thunderstorms per day on Earth. So this is a very common severe weather occurrence. And as we all know, um, these can be mild, anywhere to quite severe. So what creates a thunderstorm? So thunderstorms occur because of convection in the atmosphere. So remember convection is that rising and sinking. That's the convection. Anytime you guys hear that word convection, you should be thinking of this sort of circular pattern. And why are you getting the circular pattern? Because you have warm air rising. And when that happens outside in the atmosphere, it creates what's called an updraft. And it's going to be pulling air upwards. And then now we know when it gets up there, it's going to cool off, which is going to make any water vapor that's inside that air mass condense. And if you have enough of it, and it's going to drop down to the ground and it's cool because of gravity. <clears throat> it's cool, so it's gonna sink because it's more dense. So you just get this pattern happening. Depending upon how much moisture is in the air, depending upon how different the air temperatures are, the more violent these can be. When these form, these convection cells, they're called storm cells. And you may have heard of a meteorologist saying that before. We have a storm cell moving in. So a convection cell within a cloud that's associated with a storm. So all of the principles that we've been talking about, warm air rising because it's less dense, it's gonna cool off, condense, it's gonna sink back down again because it's more dense, and then if it has precipitation in it because of gravity, it's going to fall to the ground. Like I said, the greater the temperature difference, the more moisture, the stronger the thunderstorm, the more precipitation that's gonna be associated with that thunderstorm. So think about for us up here, these really happen on those days where we have that really hot, sticky weather outside, and then we have this nice in the afternoon. If there's enough energy there, you're going to get precipitation. You're going to get that sort of release of all of that energy, and then hopefully a cooling off of temperature afterwards. So there really is almost like a life cycle of a thunderstorm. Um, so as you see in the left-hand side, that's where you would start, where you get the cumulus stage. Those are those nice, beautiful, puffy white clouds. If you're getting enough moisture brought up inside of it, the developing stage, and this happens quite quickly. You can watch this happen outside. This is something that isn't going to take hours to develop. These are things that happen quite quickly. So if you get enough energy inside of there, enough updraft, enough cooling, then now you're going to get into that actually a cumulonimbus cloud that you see on the right hand side. If it happens in the summertime, we're going to get rain. This happens in the wintertime, you are going to get snow. Remember, our temperature different uh, depends on this. Thunderstorms don't last long. They're taking a lot of energy and they're releasing them quite quickly. So they don't have a lot to hang around. Now they're called thunderstorms because they release thunder, right? So where does this come from? So if you have all this air, all of this wind moving around, what actually happens is, is you're getting a difference in charge accumulating outside. A great analogy would be <clears throat> the same thing happens in your living room. Did you guys know you create lightning in your living room? If you've got socks on or in your bedroom, you're walking around on the carpet, you're walking, walking, and you go touch a doorknob or you go to touch your brother or sister and oh, you shock them. You literally just did the exact same thing that happens outside. You, you just did it on a smaller scale. So instead of you rubbing your socks on the carpet, like you can see on the, my top right picture, it's wind outside. So that wind outside, those air moving patterns, will create a difference in charge outside. This actually comes from electrons. So when that happens, when you get a difference of charge, opposite charges in nature are attracted to each other. So the negatives want to be by the positives. So what happens is, is those negatives are like, oh, we got to get back to the positives. And they do so by lightning. So lightning is an electric discharge between a cloud and the ground, or it can actually be within the cloud. So it can happen up in the cloud as well. It can happen between two clouds up in the sky. So 
That is what lightning is. It's just these electrons that were built up, they had a difference of charge, and they want to balance each other out so they create lightning. So lightning is electricity. That's all it is. It is really powerful. It is a lot of electricity. We're not talking about like the type of electricity that's going through your outlet at, ho at home, much stronger. It's also extremely hot. Lightning is hotter than the surface of the sun. Now, anytime you heat anything up, what have we been talking about this year? If you heat something up, it causes things to expand, right? Those molecules get moving faster. They move away from each other. So as that lightning goes through the air, this electric discharge, which is crazy hot, it heats up the air. That expansion, that heating the air up, is where thunder comes from. So thunder, the sound that occurs when lightning heats the air and it expands. So that's the reason why these two things are with each other. Now, what do we always notice first? Lightning? Yes, because light travels faster than sound. Light travels faster than sound. The closer those two are together, we do those. I remember when I was a kid, we learned that thing. Um, when you see the lightning, you start counting one Mississippi, two Mississippi, three Mississippi. The closer those are together, the closer you are to the lightning, right? If it's far away, if the lightning's far away, you're going to have a much stronger lag time between the two. Really important lightning safety. Um, lightning being electricity doesn't discriminate. It wants to take the quickest path possible. So if you are the quickest path possible outside, it's going to reach you. So that's why it's really important when you see lightning outside. And if you are out on the water, get out of the water. Because if you're on a large body of water, even if it's a lake, like in, I'm not talking about Lake Superior, any lake that we have around here, if you were on the lake, you were the tallest thing on that lake. So if that lightning comes anywhere near the lake, it's going to want to find you because you are the tallest thing. So if you're on the water, you want to get out of the water. If you are anywhere in an open field, um, common places would be like a golf course. You're at a baseball game. There's a reason, you know, as soon as you see lightning outside in a baseball game, it's going on, get off the field. You don't want to be the tallest thing outside. The other thing is you want to make sure um, that you are not underneath a tree because here's the other thing if you're standing underneath a really tall tree or let's say you go camping and you put your tree your tent under a tree if that tree gets struck by lightning that electricity is going to go all the way down through the tree down through the roots and if you're laying on the ground it's going to go through you so that's the reason why we don't want to um, stay under a tree or lay flat on the ground indoors is best inside of a car our cars have rubber tires which are great insulators from electricity so don't be outside if electricity strikes hurricanes uh, hurricanes are tropical cyclones with wind speeds of at least 74 miles per hour so it's going to be um a tropical storm as soon as it reaches that threshold of the wind speeds being sustained at 74 miles per hour, it has now been upgraded to a hurricane. Um, and if you've paid any attention to the weather, you know that we name them. They actually have a whole naming system that they use. I believe they alternate the alphabet um, and they actually al alternate boy, girl. I believe they used to just use, um, um, I don't remember, but now we, we alternate so we can have equal um, things there. And they actually will go through the alphabet. We used to, I believe in some ways, not get through the alphabet every year and now we get more through the alphabet. There's definitely been an increased in amount of hurricanes um, throughout the globe here. They are, when you look at them, the picture on the left hand side there, that is an actual picture of, you know, a satellite image of a hurricane. And you'll notice on the picture there, there is a distinct pattern to those hurricanes. You can see we have sort of like a spinning there, right? We've been talking about all these winds, it's kind of like a spinning. And you'll notice in the middle there, um, it looks like there's almost an eye to the hurricane, and that's actually what it's called is the eye of the hurricane. Bizarrely enough, that is the spot which is the least, um, it has the least winds out of the entire hurricane. On the outside of the hurricane, it's all of the, the rain and the winds that is coming from the outside of it that is going to cause the damage from the hurricane. So... Why don't we have hurricanes in Minnesota? Because we don't have warm ocean water. That is what you need. If you look at the picture on the right-hand side, hurricanes need warm ocean water, more than 80 degrees, to get the energy going 
for the hurricanes. The winds will come together, forced, uh, forcing air upwards. So let's say we have two different wind masses uh, meeting each other. The wind will flow outward above the storm, allowing the air to rise. Uh, humid air makes the clouds of the storm. Um, and then you're going to have winds outside the hurricane steer it and let it, let it grow. When these are over water, they're going to continue to grow, continue to grow. So as soon as they reach land, they no longer have that warm ocean water fueling them to keep them moving. So we actually use what's called a Saphir Simpson, excuse me, Saphir Simpson hurricane scale to rate hurricanes. Um, you look at the right hand side there, you can see the characteristics for if we call it a tropical de depression or a tropical storm. Now you'll start to look at the different categories of, of, of hurricanes. Um, category five is the most devastating damaging hurricane. So wind speeds greater than 250 kilometers per hour. This is where you're going to see catastrophic damage. If you look at the picture um, in there, and, and like we said, where is that coming from? It's coming from the wind speed of the hurricane and from increased water. So a lot of homes that are built near um, hurricane areas, you will often see them on stilts. So you will see them up above the ground. They also frequently have um, ways for their windows to be easily, you know, boarded up. So you can see in the picture there, people will board it up with plywood, but if you're talking about a newer construction home, they're going to be just having things that are already there in place. So it's really, really easy to uh, board that up. So hurricanes can be really devastating. This year, I believe we've had, the problem is, is if you have a category five, um, the category five, uh, reach land is where we have issues with that. Tornadoes. Tornadoes are severe weather that are systems of rotating wind speeds around a low pressure center. Now you'll notice a difference here. So these are both rotating winds. Hurricanes are much larger. So on average, they are really, really large. Um, whereas tornadoes average diameter is typically much much smaller. The other thing is is hurricanes last longer Tornadoes are quicker. So they typically don't last as long hurricanes last much longer So to uh, tornadoes are systems of rotating wind speeds around a low pressure center um, There is places on earth where we have these conditions exist where these will pop up and I'm going to show you here in a second so in the picture on the right hand side, there is in the central part of the United States, we call these tour, uh, this location, the tornado alley. So during peak time of the year, there's usually one tornado per day that you're going to get um, in that blue, blue zone there. So we are now learning a lot more about tornadoes um, up until recently. You know, these are hard to study. We're talking about wind systems that are really, really dangerous. So when you talk about, I'm a scientist, I'm going to go study. Uh, near here, and you may have seen some movies of sort of like uh, dramatic sized it like Twister is probably one. Uh, but when you look at this, there's some conditions that you need. What you really need is, is you need really cool and really warm air meeting each other. Conditions just right. It's like they crash into each other. Imagine two trains crashing into each other. And if you get the spin just right, then you're going to get a tornado. So Tornado Alley this happens in the spring and throughout the summer because you get these really nice cool winds from Canada coming down and you get these really warm winds coming up uh, from Mexico, Texas area. So you have just the conditions just right in the central part of the United States for that to happen. And by the way, that doesn't really happen anywhere else on earth. We are kind of significant for this um, of being tornado alley. So um, really cold, really warm air meeting each other is where we get uh, the, those tornadoes. So what we use to measure tornado damage is called the Fujita scale. And we will say it's an F0, an F1, an F2. That's how they say it. And you will notice um, an uh, F5 or EF5 is another way they say it, um, is the most damaging tornado. When you're, If you were looking at an EF5, you were looking at complete devastation. So it says on this, the scale there, strong frame houses leveled off their foundations and swept away. So if you look at the picture on the upper right hand corner there, that is definitely an EF5 tornado that went through there. You'll notice right through the path. Whereas if you look at the upper picture on the right, it wouldn't be an EF5. Um, it's probably an EF3 or an EF2 tornado. Um, that is a brick house though. So you'll notice that the parts that are wood are much more 
uh, devastated in the other. Picture on the lower le left-hand corner, same thing. That is an EF5 tornado. tornado. You are talking about um, when these things go through complete devastation, and it's just fascinating too, if you look at that upper right-hand picture, you have some people's houses that are completely untouched, whereas the, the thing right next to it, your neighbor's house, can be completely leveled. Um, if you are talking about tornado safety, indoors, lowest level possible. Lowest level possible. One of the problems with this is in the south, basements are not common. You know, for us, we all have basements. We can go, go down in our basements. Um, so that's not common. So typically when you are there, they are told to go into a central location into your home, go into a bathtub, um, things like that. That's going to be the safest place to be. Um, tornadoes used to typically happen uh, later evening. Now we are starting to see them happen throughout the evening. The hardest part about these um, is getting people noticed that they're happening so they can get to safety. Um, that's what a lot of the research is leaning towards is what can we do to give people the most amount of time so they can get to a safe location. And if they're happening at night, that's, that's a really hard time because people have gone to sleep. They're not going to get the notice. Um, that, that can be a, a real big problem. The last thing the chapter talks about in terms of weather patterns is called El Nino Southern Oscillations. So usually the trade winds blow warm water from east to west across the Pacific Ocean, like you see in the picture on the lower left-hand side there, one of our global wind patterns. But what, what we noticed, or specifically Peruvian fishermen noticed, was every so often the trade winds will actually weaken and the warm water um, will actually reverse direction. It increases thunderstorm activity, and the reason the fishermen noticed is it actually changed uh, the amount of fish that they would typically get. So what El Nino does is, is it changes uh, the wind flow, air pressure, and thunderstorm activity across the Pacific Ocean. So normal weather patterns that we, we see would actually get reversed. Um, so during El Nino, as you can see here, you get a complete um, different weather pattern. And believe it or not, uh, this can even affect weather in the United States. So El Nino can actually come all the way up to us and affect weather patterns for us. There's a milder pattern that happens every few years called La Nina, um, which also occurs. So severe weather, really a wonderful, fascinating topic. Um, lots of cool things with it. We're going to watch a few more videos on it and things just to help us learn about it, but really cool stuff.